All right, guys, what's going on? Welcome in. So mandatory minicamp for the New York Jets is finally here. I know it's not, uh, you know, on the same level as maybe the start of the regular season and the start of preseason, but look, I get fired up for this stuff. I love football. Okay, and in this one, I wanted to talk about a couple storylines that I'm going to be watching and monitoring uh, throughout the course of the three-day uh, the three-day uh, minicamp here, June 14th, June 15th, and June 16th. Though it's only just a quick little three-day period, uh, so let's get into the first point here. It's Makai Becton's health. There was a real lack of clarity last season surrounding Makai Becton and his injury, right? He missed so much time. Nobody seemed to have an answer uh, on when he was going to be back, the timetable to return. It just, it, it literally seemed like nobody had a clue what was going on. Just one big question mark, okay? So fast forward, we're now in 2022. And the, the, look, this Jets team has a ton of young talent. I love the direction of the franchise, but there's a lot on Makai Becton's plate, okay? There's a lot riding on his performance here. The Jets didn't go out and sign a big marquee tackle, okay? They didn't re-sign Morgan Moses. We, they didn't draft one, whether it's top, you know, uh, you know, in the top four, obviously going Sauce Gardner at spot number four, uh, or if you want to talk about second round, third round. It wasn't until round four that the Jets selected a tackle. So th they are investing heavily heavily in Makai Becton. Let's see, let, let's see where he stands. Okay. He missed voluntary OTAs due to the birth of his child, which is totally understandable, but now it's time from it, it's, it's the mandatory part of camp. So let's see how he does on the field, right? This is the stuff that I get excited about. Also, not only just the health, but what position does he start at left tackle or right tackle? I believe George Fant did enough last season. And I think he projects well into 2022 as the starting left tackle for the team. But at the same time, I don't want Joe, du or I don't want uh, Robert Sala and Mike LaFleur just to hand out positions like, you know, oh, you're the guaranteed starter. You know, if there's a competition there with two players that have more than enough talent to go out there and succeed, then I want a competition. Okay, so the left tackle job is up in the air. It could be Fant, it could be Becton. We'll see how it plays out. It's looking like the loser is going to transition over to right tackle. Okay, so we'll see how it all, you know, we'll see how the dominoes fall. The Jets did bring in Riley Reef for a visit a handful of days ago, right? Former Bengal, Viking, and Lion. Uh, so we'll see if something gets done within the next few days or something like that. Maybe the Jets want to uh, really check out the tackle position first in the three-day camp and then make a move with Riley Reef. Of course, that is dependent on how much he wants for a contract. I know last year he did sign that one-year deal roughly around the $7 million mark, which I, I think for me personally at this point is a little too expensive for Reef. but you know, um, you know, I'm not the general manager here. I think if I was in charge, I would I, I would be open to handing out a three to five million dollar deal. I think that's fair. But anything, you know, upwards of six, seven, eight, nine, ten million dollars for Riley Reef, uh, in other words, a swing tackle, a backup swing tackle, uh, plan B insurance policy, I think that is a little high. But anyway, I'm definitely going to be focused on the tackle position. Next up, number two, the new faces, right? How do the new faces look? We're talking free agency and the draft here. Joe Douglas went out and spent a ton of money on major talent here, okay, coming in at positions of need. Then a month later, he goes and he attacks the draft with three first round picks, a second, a third, two fourths. Look, the Jets are relying heavily on this new group of, uh, of talent here, new group of players to really propel this thing in the right direction. Okay, so there's a lot riding on all of these new acquisitions, young and old. How do they look? Right now, I'm going to say this as kind of a rough outline, a rough initial thought, I guess. Free agency, immediate impact, right? I'm not expecting Lake and Tomlinson to have a year-long learning curve. I'm not expecting guys like Uzama, Conklin, right? DJ Reed to have this major onboarding process where it takes them, you know, 10 games to get into the thick of it. These guys are proven players, right? They, Jordan Whitehead's another guy. All of the free agent acquisitions need to produce pretty much immediately. Whereas the rookies, you know, Sauce Gardner, spot number four, Jermaine Johnson, Garrett Wilson, Brees Hall. Uh, and we could go down the list here too of Jeremy Rucker, Michael Clemens, and uh, Max Mitchell. This also goes for the undrafted free agents as well. You know, those guys definitely definitely have you know a bit of a transition period the talent the scheme everything like that the chemistry with guys around them obviously working with brand new coaches here uh stepping up from college to the pros you know if sauce Gardner takes a couple weeks 
to get into the thick of it, right? If he doesn't really look like the, the you know, a top five, top 10 shutdown corner immediately, that's okay. You know, a quick little side note, think about all the dominant corners in today's foot in today's uh, game with uh, Trey, uh, uh, Trey White, Marlon Humphrey, Jair Alexander, uh, who else? Xavier Howard. You know, these guys didn't burst out into the scene as elite corners from the first game on. You know, there was a little bit of a learning curve. There was a, a bit of a transition. The point is, you know, the young players on this Jets team, there's... I, I'm expecting some time to grow. There's going to be some growing pains that's expected. But again, going back to the free agency uh, or the free agents, I want those guys to immediately produce. Next up, number three are the positional battles, right? Looking at safety. Uh, Jordan Whitehead's obviously going to be locking down one of the safety positions, but the other one is kind of up in the air. Is it going to be the the seasoned veteran LaMarcus Joyner, ex-Raider, ex-Ram, a guy who's produced uh, a lot in his NFL career, even going back to you know college at Florida State. This guy's moved all around the defense, played some nickel corner, uh, although I do feel like he is more so a safety today. We got guys like Ashton Davis and Will Parks on the roster, but the really interesting one, the guy that's been turning heads is Jason Pinnock, former late round pick out of Pitt as a cornerback. You know, he has the size, strength, athleticism, and speed to play the safety position. In fact, he made the positional change, as we all know, late last year and looked solid in the three games, right? In the last three games of the season, uh, he looked like he could hold it down okay now all of a sudden he's going to have a full training camp a, a preseason a, he's going to be a safety from the beginning you would think you would assume that that would speed up his uh, uh the learning process and he would get better over time at the safety position i also think that this system will allow jason pinnock to, to to really build off of his strengths and he has a lot of room to grow at the position okay with the size his ability in the uh, to stop the run tackling an open field using his size and arm length. I mean, Pinnock definitely has some potential to him for sure, but safety is just one position. We could also look at weak side um, linebacker as well. You know, Hobson, Dean, Jamie, and Sherwood. Will the Jets bring in and, and you know, sign Quan Alexander? Only time will tell. Uh, defensive tackles, another one. What's going to be the exact lineup? Sheldon Rankins. Quinn Williams obviously is obviously going to be a starter. But what's happening with Solomon Thomas? He's another interesting, uh, you know, interesting case study. Former high pick. You know, hasn't really worked out that much. But when you talk about just raw potential, Thomas brings that uh, to the table. And he was the third overall pick by the 49ers all those years ago by Robert Sala. So one would assume that there is going to be a plan in place for Solomon Thomas uh, for the upcoming season, but I do feel like the loss of Fadakasi will hurt this team unless something is addressed, whether it's bringing in Larry Okunjobi, whether it's somebody on the roster, maybe a Nathan Shepard or, or somebody like that, somebody steps up and really starts producing uh, in the running game. But the positional battles from top to bottom, you know, in this... Also, I guess, um, you know, ties into depth chart rankings, and we're not going to have all the answers by the end of this three-day period, but, you know, we can even look at running back. What's the running back depth chart going to look like with Michael Carter, Brees Hall, Tevin Coleman as well? What's happening at corner, like DJ Reed, Sauce Gardner, then Michael Carter, Bryce Hall, like how is the lineup going to be? So a bunch of interesting little, you know, uh, uh, side stories that we can look into here, but overall, the positional battles is something that I'm really going to be monitoring over these next three days. Point number four, Zach Wilson's development. And, you know, we've made the point over and over on this channel where whether Zach Wilson is performing well, whether he's performing poorly in these, you know, little, you know, voluntary OTAs, the seven on seven non-contact style of sessions, you know, it's not the biggest deal in the world. Why? Because it's June. You know, if Zach Wilson is struggling week five, week six, week seven in the NFL regular season, yeah, it's probably going to be a problem. There, there will be an issue going on. But because it's June, I'm not, I mean, that, that's why the team practices, right? To iron out the kinks, to really get everybody on the same page, to build the chemistry, to, to that, that's, the, that's like the definition of practice, right? To, to get better at something. So if Zach Wilson is struggling, if he is missing guys, if he is throwing interceptions, obviously it's not what you want here as a Jet fan. I can speak for everybody, but at the same time, you you can push back and say, that's the point of practice. I would much rather have it now than later on in the season. And then we can take a look at the other side of the coin. If Zach Wilson does well, right? He's not turning the ball over. He's not putting the ball in harm's way. He's accurate. Uh, he knows where to go with the football. The decision-making is there. The command is there. Uh, arm strength, mobility. 
leadership, everything that goes into it. If if he's checking those boxes and, and he's doing well in this little three day period, then great. That's just an added plus. But at the end of the day, no matter what happens, he does great. He does poorly. It's still only June. There's so much time before the start of the regular season. So anyway, those are my uh, storylines that I'm going to be watching you know, uh, throughout the course of this week. I would love to hear yours down below in the comment section. Thanks so much for watching. I appreciate it. And as always, go Jets.